Uh, so I have a bunch of slides that are mostly just sort of little cues for me to various talking points I have. I'm also a pretty casual speaker, and so I much prefer, especially with a topic like scaling people and uh, all issues around hiring and recruiting and those things to do sort of uh, Q&A. You could actually write a book. In fact, there are probably dozens of books about people and people management. Uh, and I am by, by no means an expert, but I think I have made uh, enough mistakes that I haven't repeated uh, and enough good moves that I have a pretty good idea of how to build a company and how to uh, build it for longevity. Uh, and this company has been around for a while and it's, it's growing quickly. So I thought I'd give my quick background. Uh, so I have worked, I'm a technologist. I have worked, my first job was in an ISP, learning all about routing and networking in Unix. That was in eighth grade. I then went and left that ISP and I joined a company called mp3.com. I was the 30th person at that company and I watched them to go from 30 people to over uh, 300 people. And at that time when you, uh, it was, this was like 1999, I went to an IPO party. They, went through, they had an IPO, I went to the IPO party. I saw things that no 17 year old should ever see. Uh, I was like, all right, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and I hope I never see those at my company. <laughs> Then I, I went to college, I went to Washington and St. Louis. I started a company in college that uh, some of you may have used. Uh, and then when I graduated and moved out here, a year later I started a company called OpenDNS. In between graduating college and starting OpenDNS, I worked for a guy who was like my hero on the internet when I was growing up. And then he turned out to be an incredible guy, an awesome person, but a terrible manager. So that was my first real experience with uh, having somebody who could be an awesome person, but a terrible manager. Uh, and so maybe we'll, we'll find some time to talk about that. I did think I wanted to just do a quick check. So I want to make sure that I'm using really good use of your time. So I don't, know how, I don't have a good sense of people here or people that are like, hey, I came here to hack on code. I came here to hear a talk about hiring and dealing with uh, great coworkers, managers, scaling teams. How do I become a great manager? Uh, if you're a startup founder, if you're an aspiring startup founder. Um, so if you're somebody who is a startup founder or aspiring startup founder, raise your hand. Oh good, that is a lot of you. Um, or if you're just an aspiring leader, which is kind of like the same thing, even inside of another company, that is also good. Okay, good, so this is a topical, hopefully this is a topical talk. Um, okay, so the quick, just to give you, I'm not gonna talk about opening this much actually, other than through anecdotes and stories, um, but to give you a quick uh, sense of the company, our company's actually gone through a bunch of different changes and transitions. So we launched the company in 2006 as a consumer-focused, uh, safer, faster DNS service. You switch your DNS to ours and we would block phishing sites. We provided content filtering for parents. Uh, it became very, very popular uh, in terms of users and traction and people uh, began to recognize our brand. The business model was not a business model we loved. We had an advertising business model and we always felt that we were trying to give a better user experience and that was at the expense of revenue or if we tried to make money, it was at the expense of the user experience like advertisers wanted pop-up ads and flash ads. And ultimately in 2009, we shifted over, at the very end of 2009, the beginning of 2010, we shifted the business to selling enterprise security. That basically resulted in us changing out almost the entire team of people we have here for a variety of reasons, which we can talk about. Uh, so it was almost, other than the name of the company, it was a complete restart, and I, I stuck around, obviously. Um, and now we are a fast growing enterprise security company, and the engineers who have been here a while, and the people who have been here at the company for a while now realize we have salespeople, we have marketing people, we have field sales people located in all kinds of different places. Uh, we occasionally have dogs also in the back. That's evidence of the dogs. And I, we have a CEO, that's me. And so for this talk, there's like CEOs essentially have three jobs, that, that, like three things that are important to them that they care about. And it's making sure you have enough money in the bank, uh, making sure they have the right people in the team, and then make sure there's a vision for the company. And it's actually basically all you have to do. Um, there's obviously a little bit more to like making sure you have money in the bank, which means going and raising money or selling a product that generates revenue. Uh, with a team, you have to hire the people. We're going to talk about this today. Like, how do you find the right people? How do you bring them into the company? How do you keep them at the company? And then how do you get rid of the people that are not the right fits for the company and what the company needs? And then vision is obviously the most, uh, you know, it's ultimately the thing that is the seed of why you have a company in the first place. Um, so I like human resources. I think of myself as like a student of human resources. It turns out the world doesn't like to use that term anymore. They call it sort of people operations. And it sounds, it's just the same thing. Uh, I like people operations. It's actually one of the things that gets me most excited about coming to work. 
I love our customers. Uh, I love the products we build, but I actually like the people that I work with the most. Uh, and while we have had great people all along the, the many years of growing the company, I, have, I feel like we have the best team we've ever had and the right people at the right time, which is an, time is an important element for people, but having the right people at the right time. There's people that we had when we were 10 people that were awesome when we were 10 people, but would be a nightmare today. But if I was starting another company, I would go out and hire those people again. And so I thought I'd talk you through some of the different things when I think of people operations. And again, this is sort of superficial, and I'm going to go through most of it quickly because then I thought we could do Q&A. And some of you might say, hey, how do I, what are the things that I should think about as my company goes from 50 people to 100 people or from 10 people to 20 people? People don't always think about it, but 10 people to 20 people doesn't sound like that many new people, but it's 100% growth, which means that if you do that, if you go from 10 to 20 in a year, it means at the end of the year, half your company has been there less than a year which is sort of crazy when you think about how do you build a culture and how do you, how do you inculcate uh, the values that are important to you. How do you manage people? How do you promote people? There's a lot of people that think that in order to be uh, successful, they have to be promoted or they have to manage people and that's the only definition of success. And so they get into this crazy cycle of like, I need to be a manager, I need to be a manager, but like mathematically not everybody can be a manager, right? Um, or, or if you do that in your company, it, it probably will not work out well. Uh, and then scaling, ultimately, how do you make sure that the people that you want to stick around for the long haul stick around? Uh, and then the last part, which is a topic that is very important and most people don't spend time on, is like, how do you, how do you part ways with people? How do you fire people? How do you get rid of the people uh, that you don't want to be at your company anymore? Uh, and it happens all the time. You hope that it doesn't, but it does. Uh, and it's a part that I think like very few people have training on. Uh, I have very few things I regret in my life, but one of the things in my life I regret was the first time I ever fired somebody and the way that I handled it. Uh, I basically tried to tell them they were being laid off, but they knew they were being fired because they weren't very good, and it was terrible. And I told myself I would never lie to somebody uh, uh, in that way ever, ever. I mean, you don't want to lie in general, but I would never like tell somebody they were being laid off if they knew they were being fired. Um, because then they're like, oh, well, look, you know, maybe you can just change my salary. And it's like, well, that's not really the problem. All right. So... Why focus on people operations uh, and why is it important? Uh, I think this is obvious to people, but you work with these people every day. If it turns out that the people you work with are not the right people, you are not gonna wanna go to work, you are not gonna be happy, you're not gonna be motivated. Uh, and so when you're at a company, especially when you're building a startup, like startups are hard. And if you don't realize that they're hard yet, then you just haven't been doing it long enough because it will get very hard. And there's gonna be bad days and there's gonna be bad weeks and hopefully there's not bad quarters and bad years. But you want to make sure that like, even though it's really hard, you feel this great sense of camaraderie and teamwork, a strong foundation of trust. One of the things that I've discovered over the years that's most important is like, do I trust that the person I work with is capable of doing their job? That, it turns out that it seems like a really easy question, but when you start to ask people, like if you have internal conflict in your teams, it generally always comes back to this idea of, do I actually think that this person that I have an issue with is capable of doing their job? Because if you believe that they're capable of doing their job, like they have the talent, they have the technical chops, then chances are you can work out most of the other issues, whether it's personality issues or style issues. But generally, if you, if you actually don't think the person's up to the task, you, you can't, there's no fixing it beyond that. Uh, so you wanna make sure it looks like this as you climb this mountain and it's really arduous, um, and ultimately not like this. Uh, so I have been in times in this company when parts of it, different little parts at different times have kind of looked like this and felt like this. And generally when it rains, it pours, uh, or in this case, the whole field catches fire. Um, so I thought we'd start with recruiting, which I think is the first part of building a company. And that is about, and, and people often confuse recruiting with hiring. And so when I talk to, I've made a couple of angel investments and I talked to lots of startup founders and they talked to me about how like, they're like ready to get hiring. And they, you know, they closed a small round, they raised a couple hundred grand, maybe they have a half a million bucks in the bank and like, they're like, I'm gonna go out and hire five people. And I'm like, well, how did you come up with that number? Why five? Why not six? Why not four? Like, what, why five? Well, you know, maybe I have five hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to pay people about a hundred grand. That's five people. I'm like, okay, well, you're you're in big trouble. Um, <laughs> you also don't know where the money will go. <laughs> so, I think of recruiting as like this idea of before you start hiring, you need to think about who does your company want to be, what is your culture going to be. You also need to do the actual tactical work of figuring out like, do I have budget to hire these people? It's crazy to me that people hire way, way ahead of what they can actually satisfy in their company, the workload that they have to do. There's always gonna be more work that you have to do than you actually have people to do. Like that will never change. We went, 
you know, when we had 50 people, there was always more that we wanted to do. But we have 100 people, there's more that we want to do that we can't do. We have, you know, we're approaching 300 people. We'll be there in, you know, in, in a matter of weeks. And there's still so much more that we'd like to do. Um, so hiring people doesn't really fix the problem of like having more work than people. That, that problem actually never goes away. But what does go away is the idea of thinking about who do I need and when, thinking about who is that person going to report to. Again, when you have five people, they're all going to report to you. It's very easy. Uh, but as you start thinking about managers, you start realizing, wait a minute, how many people is reasonable to report to me? Can I have 10 people report to me? Can I have 20 people report to me? The answer to that is no. By the way, you cannot have 20 people report to you. Um, it's happened. It's horrible. Maybe it works for a month. Maybe it works for two months. But people, it turns out, we'll talk about managing in a minute, but people need one-on-ones. They need to know what's going well, what's not going well, what's going on in the company. You need to know what's going on in your employees' lives to the, to the extent that it affects their performance. And if you never have one-on-ones with people, you'll never find those things out. And if you have 20 direct reports, you will either never do your job or you will always be in one-on-ones. Right, so that doesn't work. So there's some number that you have to start thinking about. And recruiting is about this idea of planning the process of hiring. And part of that is, you know, why would someone want to work at your company? I think one of the things that often, often happens when I meet with founders is they're so passionate about their idea, but they do a terrible job of explaining why somebody else would want to be interested in their idea. And you know, what, what, the same way you need to refine your pitch to investors, and generally you can use the same pitch, but you need to make a pitch. You need to sell yourself and sell your company to somebody you want to hire. It's easy to go get you know, the co-founder that you do ideation with and that you hire someone in with, but once you're at 10 people or 20 people or 50 people or 100 people or 200 people, you need to have a clear idea of why, why you want to bring people into the company. And what we've found here, this company has had stair steps of hiring. And every time we sort of hit a plateau in hiring, it's not been because we didn't want to hire people or we didn't have budget, but it was either because we, didn't, we weren't bringing in the candidates or we weren't closing the candidates. And generally, it's been because we actually weren't doing the recruiting part. We weren't answering the questions of, what is the real job description here? Who's it going to report to? Do we know what this person wants to do? And we would just waste time on candidates. We'd waste the candidates' time, right? Uh, and so I think understanding your, re your recruiting engine in that process allows you to hire the right people and quickly. And in fact, if I look at, we, we, we do, a, we're a pretty introspective company, which I'll, I'll talk about later. But when we look at the people that we hired in those plateaus when we had trouble bringing, sourcing the right candidates and closing the right candidates, they actually were not always our best hires either. And I think it's because we didn't have that well-oiled recruiting engine. And so when we do Q&A, I think recruiting is an area where people don't invest enough time ahead of time. And it's one of those things that certainly pays dividends in the long run. But my favorite topic is hiring. And one of the things that I tell people all the time is hiring is number one. It's also exhausting. It's also, you know, it's painful. It's horrible. Nobody likes to hire. Interviewing is terrible. Uh, it takes a lot out of you. You have to bring your A game when you're interviewing people. But to drive home the point, I played with an animation. And I think it's going to show up here. And, and the reality is you're bringing people into your company. And like, there's messages that get reiterated over and over here that I've seen play out over and over. And for example, you want to spend time hiring the right people because hiring the wrong person is so much more painful. It's not just painful for the person that you part ways with, but it's painful for the company. You waste three months, you waste five months, you waste you know, however much time it takes to realize they're not the fit, then to restart your search, and then to close a new candidate. Right? You're now six months down the road, and you regret it, and it's horrible. So how do you hire the right people? So I think that you have to be really clear on having a really high bar. In fact, that you know, for us, because we're full of nice people and lots of companies are full of nice people, it's very, very easy to lower your bar because you like somebody um, or just because you think that they had a good conversation, but you don't actually know if they're good. And it turns out, and this is terrible, most people are actually not, not particularly good or they're not good for the role that you're hiring for. And so you know, I sort of bucket people into a few different groups. There's people that are, that are full on incompetent. If, by the way, if you bring people that are incompetent into your office for an interview and you weren't able to screen them out in a phone screen, you've, you're, you're, we'll talk about this in a minute, but you're doing a big disservice. There's people that are fairly unmotivated. And in the early days of your startup, you definitely can't have this. It's totally unacceptable. Uh, there are some jobs maybe somewhere where you can deal with people that, you know, they just want to punch a clock, they just want to sit there, uh, and that's okay, but, but not for your startup, right? That's not okay. Uh, and you don't want to be spending time heavily coaching people, telling them how to be a productive employee, how to get along with their coworkers. You don't want people that are unmotivated to solve their own problems in the early days. And then you have these people that are good, right? So I think of people that are good as people that 
as the company grows, maybe I'll have them. Maybe they're a big company kind of person. Uh, they'll sort of play a role. Maybe they'll raise their hand when they see something wrong. I generally refer to these people as like critics, as in they point out the flaws, but rarely actually care about solving them. Uh, and, and it's okay, but again, when you're building a startup and you're in your first 10, 20, 100, you know, 200 people, you can't deal with people that are good. But then you get this really small band of people, and the question is like, how do you identify these people? How do you bring them in? These are the people that are excellent. Um, and the people that do more, that are constantly in the pursuit of improving themselves, they step up to the plate. And then there's the people, uh, and I feel very fortunate to work with a bunch of these people, who make me excited to come to work every day, and they actually make me want to work harder because I'm embarrassed that I'm actually not as good as they are. And, and this happens, this is now happening all the time for me because the people are, are, if you raise the bar with every hire, ultimately you are the least competent person in the company, and I've been here the longest, so I'm the least competent person in the company. Uh, but I come to work and there's these people that certainly raise the bar on hiring, and they make me very excited and motivated. And the challenge is, how do you not waste time on bad candidates and get these people in? And I think that you have to very clearly define who it is you're looking for. You have to have a very clear pitch on what you're looking for in the candidates. You have to look to your referral network. And if, you're not, if you don't feel like you have a good, strong referral network, one of the best things I, you know, I hear from people, like, oh, I work at VMware, or I work at Microsoft, or I work at Google, and you know, I don't know if I'll be a good startup founder. But I'm like, but you're working with a talent pool of incredible people. Some of those people clearly are going to be in your network that are excellent people, that are inspirers. Uh, and so sometimes working at a big company is a great way to get started with a company because you have a huge talent pool uh, that you can meet with. And actually coming to events like this is another great way to meet people who are excellent and inspiring. So, oh, my animation didn't work. I was, this was supposed to be like a question and then the animation was supposed to give you the answer. Um, so <laughs> the, the, one of the things that drives me absolutely bananas, and really it's, it's painful, is that when you're interviewing a candidate, you have to bring your A game. Think about this. They've, even if you're interviewing 10 candidates, for the person you're interviewing, they're only going to bring their best if you bring your best. And so it's exhausting. And in fact, you're asking similar questions to different candidates. And so the goal for me is, like, I never want somebody to walk in the front door who's not one of those inspiring people, who's not an excellent candidate. And, and we'll talk about how to do that in a second. But it really is demoralizing when you're interviewing a bunch of people and you're like, God, these people are not going to be good for us. Well, how did they get in the front door? Why did we do this? And it's exhausting. And then by the time you get to the fifth candidate, and now you're, you know, you're totally drained, you're exhausted, and maybe that's the one. Maybe that's the diamond. Maybe that's in, the inspiring person. Uh, and so you really have to find a way to not bring in the bad candidate so that you can bring your A game for the right candidate and let them show their A game. And so one of the things that's important is to really figure out what is the interview process, how do you find out what are the best attributes of a person, how do you find out what makes them tick, what gets them excited. Um, this, is, this, is to, this is what happens when, when I interview myself. Uh, and so you have these people that, that are coming into your office, and so we spend time at our company trying to do phone screens. We want to make sure that everyone who comes into our office leaves wanting to work here. Whether or not we want them to work here, we always want that to be our decision. And it's important with every candidate. Like one of the things that happened to us in the early days is we'd bring in engineers because we weren't good at phone screening. They weren't the right engineer for us. And halfway through the interview, like we'd have one of our engineers who was interviewing the candidate just sort of like walk out. They'd be like, oh yeah, well this person's not good, so why would I waste my time? And I'm like, well, commendable on one, from one standpoint, but you're also a jerk and that's totally rude. And we messed up, we shouldn't have brought in that candidate. And then the goal is, okay, so we, we don't want them to come in. But when they do come in, you have to make sure that every single person leaves wanting to work at your company because they have friends, they tell people, they're gonna go on Glassdoor and they're gonna review what the interview process was like. They're gonna tell their roommates and, and everyone, anyone else. I mean, we've definitely had people that have left here without an offer, but who have told their friends who have then come in and actually gotten an offer. Um, so you always, not just because it's a good thing to do and to treat people nice and to treat them well, but you also, it, just for pure, pure numerical and sort of numbers reasons in terms of bringing in more candidate pipeline, you want everyone here leaving feeling really excited about the opportunity. And if you have a really strong uh, process and you train your employees to interview, like here again, you don't want employees all asking the exact same question. It's exhausting to candidates when five people come in to interview them and they all ask them the same exact, especially if it's technical. Like if you ask, if five people come in and ask the FizzBuzz question, that's really annoying and nauseating for a candidate. So you have to have a clear process on who's gonna ask what questions. I'm a big fan of two-on-one interviews, not because I wanna intimidate the candidate, but because 
sometimes it can get too boring to just have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and, or it can get like too one-sided where only the interview is asking the interviewee questions. Whereas if you have two people in the room, you can sort of create a little conversation and actually have the two interviewers talk to each other and have that, give, that, give a chance for the candidate to take a, take a breather and sort of recompose their thoughts. Uh, and so I find that to be really important. The other thing that people don't do, and they don't do this either because they're lazy or they don't do it because they don't wanna, uh, they think that like there's something wrong with it, which is references. And people that, there, there's a few people in the back that work at OpenDNS, and they know that I am, uh, I would say, maniacal about, <laughs> about references. In fact, for people that report to me, which are, are executives, I only interview the executives primarily just to get fodder for the reference checking. Um, I just need to get facts that I can go verify because anyone who's going to report to me at this company is, is, is probably a good, you know, if they're a bullshitter, they're a good bullshitter. And so what I really want to do is know what it's like for people that work for them. And I want to know what it's like for people that work with them. And so reference checking is this thing that you can do. And it's very, very easy to find out if someone's good by doing a reference checking. And you don't need to, like, do crazy dirt digging because what you find out is that great people get excellent references immediately. When I call someone up and I say, hey, you know, I email them first or I, I reach out on LinkedIn, you know, hey, I want to do a, a confidential reference check on this person. Would you be willing to talk to me? For great people, you get an immediate response, yes, I'm around this afternoon, give me a call. And you call them and they're like, you know, I loved working with this person. They, were, they, solve, they helped me solve all these problems or if they're a manager, you know, I would follow them anywhere. I really love my job, but, but the opportunity to work with this person again would be amazing. Like when you're, when you're interviewing a manager and you start to do reference checks and on the reference check you call this person and you're like, hey, was this person a good manager? Would you work with them again? The person's like, well, I really like my job, so I don't think it would be like, that's not really the right question because I'm not looking to move. That, you don't want to hire that person's manager. Uh, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't turn out very well. Excellent candidates get excellent references and they get them immediately. They never get wishy-washy references. They never get cautioned references. It, it never happens. Uh, they either get an excellent reference, or they generally get no reference at all, or no response. Uh, and I, and I, have, uh, I have, certainly for managers, I've never seen that fall apart. So one of the things we do about making sure the good people come, yeah, go ahead. So the question is, do I do blind references, or do I give the references that a candidate provides me? So there, there's definitely differences of opinion, even inside of opening S of what's appropriate. I do almost exclusively blind references. That's definitely not for anyone. I've never tanked somebody's job, I've never, I've never ruined their, their job, pro I've never gotten them fired because I talked to somebody they currently work with. I, I'm, I'm pretty diplomatic about who I reach out to. Usually it's the people that have already left the company where they currently work. Um, but I only do blind references. Uh, I do, uh, we do occasionally call the provided references and I know that for other hires that are, that are either individual contributors or, or other, other roles in the company, we do call the given references. One, one thing that's crazy is that even given, given references and provided references that somebody gives, they don't always, they're not always positive. It's, it's sort of incredible. Like if you're gonna list a reference on your resume, you better, you better be sure that this person's gonna be effusively positive uh, and talk about how awesome you are. There's a lot of people that when, they, when you give them as a reference, we call them up and they're like, well, like in the right role, I can see this person being successful. That, those, are, those are dangerous, dangerous words to give. So I, I do blind references. But I would say you do have to be careful about doing blind references. Um, I, I also stay away from sort of touchy subjects and references. I really just stick to the like, to me the, the ultimate question in a reference is, would you work with this person again? And it's a, very, it's a fairly binary answer. Yes, I totally would. Or no, I really like my job, I'm not looking, blah, blah, blah. Um, it, it, it only comes out one way. Uh, so okay, did that answer the question? Uh, then the other thing is that you do have to move quickly. And that was something we had a lot of problems with at our company. We sort of had, you know, decision paralysis, or we would, you know, we would interview the candidate, but we wouldn't all meet up as a group till maybe two days later to decide if we liked the candidate. Not only do you forget what that interview is like, but you also have waited too long, and really good candidates get offers quickly. Uh, and so we have a, we've implemented rules here where, when we get in a resume, we try to review it every 24 hours. If we do a phone screen, we try to make a decision within 24 hours. If we bring the candidate in, we try to interview, we try to give a response in 24 hours. Not only is it the right thing to do for the candidate so that they're not left hanging in the wind, but like you gotta make decisions. And when, when there's not enough consensus around the table, either the job description's not clear, the reporting structure's not clear, it's not clear who gets to make the decision on hiring, right? All these things are things you should have figured out in the recruiting process. 
but ultimately, at the end of the day, if you've solved all those things, it should be very easy to figure out, do we want this person in the company or not? Um, and you do references very quickly. Um, even if you make references, references mandatory, which they, they are here, you can get those done within 24, 36 hours. You can call the candidate and give them a verbal offer that, that's still contingent on references. Um, and so in our view is, look, you should always be back to the candidate within 24 hours of any, any interaction, and we're pretty, pretty good about that. I'm gonna flip through the last few slides here, because I do think Q&A uh, is probably more interesting. So um, to me, managing uh, is something that like, people think of as a bad, bad word, but to me, managing is all about preparing for scale and scaling. And so if you're thinking about scaling, then you get to say congratulations, it's time to grow. And there's a few things that I thought I would talk about here because management itself is not a topic that uh, I, I'm gonna talk about here, like how to be an effective manager, how to do one-on-ones, so that's that's, that is a set of, that is a wall of books worth of topics. But just some things here that I think are really, really important that I've certainly seen in my experience. One is that really making it as a part of your culture very clear that there's a big difference between being promoted and becoming a manager, those are different things. People should be able to be promoted without having to become a manager of other people. And the reality is, not everybody should become a manager, right? Like it doesn't, like not, I said at the beginning, not just mathematically does it not make sense, but there's lots of people that wanna get recognized in different ways, but they have this belief, and this, this happens, and I've seen this over and over, they have this belief that if I get promoted, that means I'm a manager. And if I'm a manager, therefore I'm, I'm like successful. And that somehow has become the definition of success. And now I'm managing a team of 10 people, therefore I'm more successful. And now I'm managing a team of 50 people, and therefore I'm more successful than I was before. Um, when, when reality is you're, you're probably not miserable. I mean, if you're me, uh, no. So, uh, but it's not, it is not the criteria for success. And so I think that what we found here is that especially as engineering teams grow, as sales teams grow, there are lots of pathways to give people this idea of career pathing, that there are ways to get more compensation, to get more recognition, uh, and, to, and to get more visibility inside the organization and find out whatever those forms of recognition are. Some people like to get recognized through more cash, like they like to get paid more. Some people like to get recognized in the sense that they have a better title or you send them out to conferences. There's all, there's all kinds of forms of recognition. Um, and so for instance, you can think of a developer who might not want to be a manager, but want to be recognized for their technical growth and their professional growth, and they become like a systems engineer or a technical lead. You know, at Google, they have this idea of a member of technical staff being sort of this, this uber generalist role. Uh, you could be an architect. Uh, and then in sales, the same thing happens. It, one of the things that was illuminating to me is that the people that get this the most are actually salespeople. We have one of our, one of our, our regional VPs, used to be a sales rep, then he, then his pre previous company, made a ton of money, then got promoted because he did so well, and he was managing a whole East Coast territory and doing very well, and then he self-selected to go back to being a sales rep because he liked being with customers, he liked closing deals, and he frankly, he felt like he could make more money and be in control of his destiny. So salespeople totally understand that being a manager is not the same thing as being promoted, and not, certainly not the same thing as success. Uh, and so I think it's a, the, one of the other ways you solve this, and it's something we do here, is we often disconnect a promotion from, from, a, from, a, from a raise, from compensation. So raises happen either at biannual times, twice a year, once a year, and I think it's important to have a cadence around that, but you shouldn't always equate that somebody being promoted is gonna be paid more. That's generally the case, but you should, I don't believe that those two actions should be linked at the same time, because it makes people think that the only way to get more money is to get promoted, and that's, that's actually sort of a dangerous line of thinking, because it creates these sort of ladder, ladder climbing set of mentalities of like, I wanna make more money, so I need to be promoted. Um, it can create politics in a company, it can create sort of like position, jockeying for position, when it's much more important to just say, look, I wanna make more money, and figure out how do you, how do you accomplish that. Last couple of slides here before I do Q&A. So communication, this one sounds obvious, but like how do you find ways to communicate? I think this is actually one of the areas where at our company we're, we're experiencing some growing pains, because like the, we, we have a company where there's like way too many meetings and way too much email, and I don't know if technology solves it, I don't know if just wiping off the whole calendar and saying which meetings are actually important solves it. But one of the things we do that really is quite nice is we have a weekly town hall meeting where it's very transparent, it's very hope, open. New employees introduce themselves and it's nice to put a, a face to people's names so that when the welcome email goes out with all the new hires every, every other week, you can actually learn something about them really quickly and, and see them. Um, and so everyone gathers here, we broadcast it to our two other offices, 
We recently had to change the time so that our London office could also participate live. So we turned out, it turns out that Friday at noon is great for the West Coast and terrible for people in London. Um, so now we do it Thursday mornings. And so we found that things like Town Hall, even though they seem, it seems dumb to get the whole company to stop what it's doing, to gather in a room every single week, but we talk about the sales numbers, we talk about new hires, we talk about new product launches, uh, and lots of people can get up and give a quick presentation. The bar to present is very high, and you're only allowed to talk for a few minutes, so that, that way we keep it sort of interesting and people don't start playing with their phones. Uh, but we do this every week, and it's turned out to be a huge benefit to keeping people in the company informed as to how we're doing. People know how we're performing financially. They know how we're doing against our hiring targets. They know what's going well in product and engineering, uh, and that's been very good. And the last piece around scaling is around this idea of being introspective and this idea of being self-aware of where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are. And so we use a tool here called CultureAmp. Uh, I think it is a underrated and super, super useful tool. The way CultureAmp works, I know it says Murmur in the corner. They're, they're one of those companies where like the company is called Murmur, but the product's called CultureAmp, or maybe it's the other way around, I don't, I don't know. Um, either the company is called CultureAmp or the product's called CultureAmp. But we use it, and it, what, the way it works is every employee in the company gets an email at, one, at, at some point during every quarter. So if you have 300 people in the company, at some point in the, in the quarter, on every day, roughly three people are going to take the survey. And there's all kinds of questions. And the survey is pretty short, and it's pretty easy. But it asks a bunch of really introspective questions around, like, do you have confidence in the leaders of the company? And one of the things that's important about the survey is it's totally anonymous. And like, it's, I mean, it's super anonymous. There's no way even I, as CEO, can like d dig in there and, and figure out who's answering what. It connects with our Google Apps account, and Murmur sends out the emails. And there's no, there's no, it, it, you know, I mean, obviously we're security companies. So if we really wanted to know, I'm sure we could. But uh, in general, you know, it is a truly anonymous survey, and so people, I think, feel comfortable giving their real assessment. And it's really a powerful tool because what happens is you ask these questions, and when we first started uh, rolling out the survey. One of the questions that it asked was like, do you think we recognize um, you know, top performers at this company? And we did really, really well there. But then it also, there was another question that said, does the company deal with poor performance at the company? And, we, and like across the board, you, you can break it down a little bit by department. If the departments are big enough, they let you break it down. And across all the departments, whether it was engineering, whether it was marketing, we scored very, very poorly. As a company that we do not deal with poor performers, and it basically was a way of a wake-up call to me that says, hey, look, you have all these high-performing people. You have all these great people, and you're not actually dealing with the sort of the people that are dragging them down. And, that, and that's something that people notice, and they realize it. And, and frankly, it's something that they, that they think is, is readily apparent, that we don't, do, you know, we don't do the hard stuff, which is you know, moving people out of the business. Um, and so we started to change that behavior, and we started putting people on improvement plans and, and managing some people out of the business. And you could see over the course of a couple quarters the, the score for that dramatically improved. And they, they give you a histogram view so you can see things change over time. Uh, and so it's quite powerful. And if you have a small company or you work at a company and you, and you think the company is going through some growing pains, you should tell your CEO or you should tell your HR person, hey, check out CultureAmp. Because I think that for us, that was a great way to get immediate visibility and an easy way into how people felt about the company. The last topic here, I think people care about firing. How do you separate with people? Um, so two things that turn out to be true, not everybody will work out. Um, what's even worse is that you might have the right person, but at the wrong time. Because um, then it's really painful, because you're like, God, you're just so awesome, just not right now. Because it turns out like you can't work well with teams. I mentioned at the beginning we had people that were great at 10 people because they were keyboard commandos and they, they generated crazy code. They didn't do any QA. They just pushed it to production and they were incredible. But then once you have teams and you have you know, tens of millions of dollars worth of customers on your infrastructure, those people do not always feel at home in your company anymore. Uh, and so they have to leave. There's also this thing that happens where you have people that are not terrible, but they're not quite awesome either. And so, and, and like you have so much work to do as a company, you're like, I can't, I can't lose this person because we have so much work to do. And so you find yourself saying this as a, as a manager, as a CEO, you know, despite the problems, we're still better off with this person than we would be without him. That turns out to never, ever, ever be true. Uh, you should just suck it up and realize that that person who's not performing, that person that you think you're better off with is actually dragging down everybody, whether it's dragging them down technically or dragging them down emotionally, and you have to move them out. So my last couple of slides are on how do you fire somebody? And the first thing is you probably don't 
do it the way Donald Trump does it. So I wouldn't say it that way. I am now a, I'm a big believer in the sort of the corporate speak of like, how do you part ways with someone? How do you just say that, look, it's not working out. We just, we, you know, you got to do something else. You got to go figure out another place to work and how can we help you do that? Um, and if you ever find somebody that you're firing saying, this is such a shock, I never expected this, then you've already screwed up. Like, one of the things that's really important to me at this company, since there are people that have to leave, is that it should never be a surprise to them. They should know that you're not happy or that they're not doing the good enough job. It, they should never be pulled into a room and told that today is their last day and have it be a surprise. If that's the way that you're running your business, you will find out very quickly that you will create a culture of fear. You will have people that are afraid that they could be fired at any minute. And, they have, and that, first of all, that will impact their performance, uh, but it's certainly not the culture that you want to instill. And so at the end of the day, people are only let go for two, two real reasons. Um, and by the way, the only time you ever like Donald Trump style fire somebody is like when you find out that they're like stealing money out of the cash register. Um, but that, that doesn't really happen at, at you know, professional technology kind of companies, um, or it's very rare. But people are let go for two reasons, performance and behavior, and you have to treat those two things differently. If it's performance related, you have no excuse not to talk to people and tell them. Even if it's the harsh truth, you have to tell them. Even if you feel like you're a nice person, you want to hurt their feelings, you have to tell them, because eventually you're going to let them go. And if you don't tell them and you let them go, it's going to be much worse. And if it's behavior related, you have to do the same thing. And when you let these people go, you have to be very clear about which one you're firing for. You don't want to confuse whether you're firing a performance person because they have bad behavior. And you don't want to tell someone who has bad behavior that you're firing them because they're not doing a good enough job. Because they'll come back to you and they'll say, but my code is good or my sales numbers are there when it's really a behavior issue. So you got to be very articulate with people and very clear about why they're being let go. And you have to tell them in advance. And by the time that people let, get let go when I'm involved in, it, in the process, they usually come to my office and you know, I bring them in and we talk about it. And I'm like, look, we talked about this. We said it wasn't working. Now it's not working. And you got to let them go. You have to do it with dignity. You have to wish them well. But you can't wait and drag things out. Um, one of the things that also happens with nice people is they drag things out because they're too afraid to give people harsh criticism. They're too afraid to fire people. And you just have to remind yourself that all the other people in the company are expecting you to let this person go. And they're waiting for you to let this person go. And even the person who's not doing well probably feels really terrible about it. It sucks to not be doing well and being told you're not doing well and just being dragged along. Um, so you have, to, you have to do it well. You have to do it quickly. You have to do it with dignity. And so... I uh, have uh, closing, closing little points that I think are truisms I've realized, and we'll do Q&A. So a couple things I've realized as this company's grown from you know, 10 to 20 to whatever, 50, 100, 250, 300, uh, as we're approaching now, no matter how great the company, no, how mar no matter how much you pay somebody, no, how, no matter how important the work that they're doing is or their coworkers are, how great the office is, no, nothing will keep a great employee at a company if his or her manager is not good. Um, and there's, th that is a total truism. They might stick it out for a month. You might be able to convince them to stick it around and that you're going to fix things. But if you don't fix it, they will leave. You cannot just pay them more money. You cannot just tell them how important their work is or the mission for the company. They will leave because good people will find a better job somewhere else. People who are not A players will never hire an A player. And unfortunately, people that are A players will still make bad hires. But it's definitely true that you, if you heard the expression that A players hire, you know, hire A players, but B players hire C players, and C players hire D players, it's very, very true. And if you ever start to sacrifice the quality of people you hire, you will see that it quickly uh, 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 reverberates throughout the company, and all of a sudden the bar is lower for the quality of people you bring in. This one's really effective when you're hiring, because a lot of you will, when I talk to startups and I talk to founders, they're like, well, I don't have as much money as that company. Or, you know, I don't have whatever, whatever the currency is that they think is valuable, and usually it's cash. They're like, well, I, don't, I wasn't on TechCrunch, and so I don't have all the PR visibility. But it turns out that people have lots of currencies in life, and cash is only one of them. And you don't always have to be the highest paying employer. You need to pay people a market rate. But you can certainly take advantage of other things, whether it's work-life balance, whether it's equity. You can sell them on how your company is actually worth nothing, and therefore, if they join your company and make it worth something, it'll be a lot more than the equity they'd get somewhere else. You can talk to them about responsibilities and role and how the impact they'll have at your company is very different and the recognition they'll get is different than elsewhere. Commute is a big one. We, frankly, when, when we felt we were in some periods where we were having trouble hiring, we realized that we just moved, you know, part of what we did was we, when we moved our office next to Caltrain, we started recruiting from people that were taking Caltrain down to San Jose. And it's like, if you work here, you're already at work. You don't have to get on a two-hour train. 
Uh, and so there's all kinds of currencies in life. Uh, commute is probably one of the greatest detractors to quality of life, and it's certainly a currency you can use to hire. Oh, oh yeah, and then the last one, uh, people don't give direct feedback. They want to be nice, and if I can impart one piece of advice on you, whether it's in the hiring process and returning, responding to candidates quickly, whether it's being a manager, whether it's talking to your boss. A lot of people don't give their bosses feedback on what would make them do their job better. You've got to give people direct feedback. They're either going to be, they're going to have their big boy pants on and they're going to be able to take it, or they won't, but that's really not your problem. That's really their problem. Uh, and ultimately, the organization will filter those things out if you have an organization that, that, uh, that, that promotes and encourages <laughs> very tactful um, and thoughtful, but direct feedback. All right, Q&A on hiring from anyone. So how do you find out that a manager is not performing? Is that, was that the question? Right, so how do you make sure the managers are doing the right things, not doing the wrong things, because nothing will make up for a bad manager? That's, first of all, it's a very hard problem because you want to respect the chain of command and you don't want to go around people, but you definitely can use tools like 360 performance reviews this culture ramp murmur thing ha has a way of sort of asking the more general question of like, do, does my manager provide me, like am I inspired by my manager? Do I feel like my manager protects me from other parts of the organization? Do I feel like they, they that like, you know, th that my team's wins are really my team's wins and not my manager's wins? There's, there's questions that can surface those things in sort of a general way. And then when you think that there's a hot spot, you can go in and do, you can encourage leadership development. You can bring in an outside facilitator so there's lots of people, and if, you, if you're in this situation, I'd be, I'd be happy to recommend, we've worked with a bunch of people over the years, and it's often really nice to bring in an outside facilitator who's like a, you know, an executive coach, and you can often tell a manager that you think is struggling, hey, we're gonna bring in this executive coach because we wanna help you grow to the next level, and sometimes that's true, but sometimes it's also to sort of surface the reality of what's happening, and that executive coach can sort of do a 360 with their peers, and oftentimes that's a good way to both improve the manager and get a really clear picture of, of what's going on. And, and sometimes that's a course correcting action. N not all problems are not correctable, right? So Ryan's question is, do you believe in totally equitable compensation across the job? So the way we have dealt with that issue is that we have bands. And you, you basically say like, for this role, this is the band. And it can be you know plus or minus maybe 10%. And sometimes for somebody who's maybe a little bit junior, and, and they're coming from a, a role and, and, and maybe it's their first job, uh, maybe they're at the lower end of that band, and you have someone who's exceptional and you have a choice. You either put them into a different band and you change their, their job title, uh, or, or you put them at the higher end of the band, and that's the way we deal with it. We do try to keep people in bands because I do think it's important. If somebody is leaving, if th is threatening to leave the company, and this has changed over the years, you know, I think that the worst time as an employee to, to ask for a raise is in conjunction with your resignation letter, right? That is the worst time. What is much better, and I know it's, it's, it's like awkward for people to think about, but it's much better to go into your boss and say, look, I love everything about working here. I love being at this company. I love the work that I do and I love the people, but I don't think you pay me enough. And I don't actually wanna go out and find out that you don't pay me enough. So I think you should pay me more. And, and people do that, and there's all kinds of ways to address it. You can address it sometimes with one-time bonuses. That's sometimes a way to like close the gap. And that way it doesn't make you feel like you're, you're jumping out of band. If they truly are exceptional, maybe you give them a promotion that, that, that takes them into another band. But I do try to be consistent because my view on both equity and salary is you have to operate the company with the belief that at some point and some day, somebody will print out the entire salary table and, and cap table and everyone will see it. And so while they might be annoyed that somebody has more than someone else, what, what I really hope is that they would look at it and be like, yep, I kind of fall into where I expect to fall in. And so I've, I've always operated the company with that belief. It does get harder when you've had people that have been here for four or five years and, and the, you know, you start to get a little bit of discrepancy. But in general, I'd like people to think that, yep, I'm paid roughly uh, equal to my peers and I fit in where I fit in. 